as some of the concepts about next-gen sequencing and how it allows us to sequence a genome. So there's a couple terms that I wanted to clarify that I think may have been a little bit confusing. Right? But before doing that, I'd like to talk about the primary goal that we're talking about here, which is the method that we use to sequence the genome of an individual or something else. All right? So for example, if a baby is in the neonatal care unit and is suffering from some sort of condition like um, failure to thrive or um, having seizures or um, has uh, you know some sort of liver toxicity um, oftentimes what can be done is uh, if there's very little knowledge about what potential cause could be is you might want to sequence the genome to see if this baby might be homozygous for some mutation that is potentially harmful all right especially if there's some sort of family history Another thing you could do is sequence the genome um, of like a tumor and you can make inferences about the DNA sequences that might be mutated that might be causing the tumor. So one term that I wanted to clarify is this concept of a reference genome. The reference genome is the genome that has already been sequenced by uh, you know, us scientists. Um, it was sequenced probably about 20 years ago. And that is the genome that one will then use to compare the sequenced genome to make inferences about what the underlying sequence is. All right, so what we have up here is a reference genome. We show it as a haploid genome, all right, even though it's you know not necessarily from haploid individual, um, although there are ways of getting a haploid genome sequence. And then we have an individual uh, diploid genome down below and we would like to sequence it, right? And that the way that the sequencing works is random fragments are obtained from the um, diploid genome and then compared to the reference genome. And the way that the comparison is achieved is through something called mapping. So for example, here I have a sequence that's randomly sequenced, right? And I would then align it to a place right here and you can see that instead of the T in the reference genome, there's a G, which indicates that there's a nucleotide difference between the reference genome and the target genome that we're trying to sequence. You might get another from the other chromosome, like this. And these random fragments are generated. You can see here that if this lines up properly, let me make sure I line it up right. There we go, all right? there's a G at this position, it's on the other chromosome, all right? And lots of places you'll sequence, for example, like right here, and there won't be a difference that shows up. And this part of the lining up that I'm doing here is called mapping. I don't even know how to map this one. Where did it come from? It came from right there, all right? And a computer does this. So a computer takes all these random bits of sequence, and it lines them up and compares them to the reference genome because the reference genome allows one to say oh this is from this particular region of the genome this is from this particular region of the genome one thing to keep in mind so here is a place where there's a nucleotide difference here's the place and then one would then if you were interested in inferring the genome sequence one would replace this t with a g here or replace this uh, C with a G here and replace this uh, C with an A here. Now, how does the computer figure this out? Well, the computer lines these sequences up, but it has some tolerance to these mismatches, right? So it allows this sequence to line up and it maps up uniquely. And remember, these are shorter sequences. Usually these are 100 base pairs. So 100 base pair sequence with one or two nucleotides that are different than the reference genome um, will easily map. Okay, so what you end up with is after you sequence, you know, many many fragments of these random pieces of DNA from the target. I mean, from the uh, individual that's being sequenced. Here's another little piece that would be lined up, maybe right there. I have to scroll back over this way to get up myself back in frame. Um, you'll end up with the next thing. So this is what we would call a pileup, and so. I showed a picture of this where there were a bunch of gray bars and there were a bunch of 
um, single nucleotide differences shown with color. But here now, instead of gray bars, I'm actually showing the full underlying sequence. Now, again, normally these would be longer, right? But I'm showing it short for this for the particular case. And so a fragment lined up here and a piece lined up here. And I'm showing in blue and in orange the fragments of DNA that were sequenced from the two different chromosomes of this individual. And you can see here that there's this inferred C there. And this looks like this individual might be heterozygous because you can see that some of the reads have a C and some of them have a G. And like, likewise, this individual might be heterozygous. And then maybe this one here is and this one here is, right? But you wouldn't necessarily always find the next base because, for example, if you didn't sequence this one here, right, then you might think that this individual might be homozygous because all you're getting is the C read. But when you sequence, oh, I'm going to undo, um, when you get another read that says, oh, okay, there's another one. Now, one thing to keep in mind is you also have to consider that there might be sequencing errors. So if you have this particular nucleotide, you need to have multiple samples of it. So it's better to have, for example, multiple copies of a, uh, of a read that would give you confidence that that truly is an A at that particular position. Okay, so um, now I want to get back to this concept of coverage now. So with respect to coverage, what I want you to do is I want to march along this particular sequence here, and you can see that at this particular nucleotide, only one nucle uh, only one read is at that position, right? And likewise here and here and here, and so we have a bunch of ones. So all of these nucleotides here have been covered once. These nucleotides aren't sampled, so there could be differences between the reference genome and the diploid sequence genome, but we wouldn't know because we have no read coverage, all right? And you can see there that those are now all zeros there. These base pairs are covered one, these base pairs are covered two, this base pair here is covered three, the reads are all covered four, so on and so forth. And there's another little gap here, which is a bunch of a set of zeros, all right? So places where you have zero coverage, that means that the target genome that you're sequencing this diploid, there were no reads that arose from it that could be mapped to the reference. Now, the reason that that was the case is it's just because it's random. This is a very important point to understand. It's not because there's something about that particular region of the genome that's recalcitrant to sequencing. It just that it happens to be that you just have no random fragments that happen to cover there because you can see that this is a random process. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is this is as if we were covering a single haploid genome, but if we think about coverage in this way, here what I have is instead of coverage just how many base pairs are um, are sequenced at a particular, I'm sorry, how many um, reads are covering a particular nucleotide, what I've converted this into is uh, coverage coming from the blue genome and coverage coming from the orange brownish genome, all right? So with these particular base pairs, we have coverage of one in the blue genome, but it's all zeros here because we don't have a read from the brown haploid genome from maybe one of the parents, all right? Um, here again, we have zero coverage. Here we have one, 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 because all the reads are coming from the brown genome. Here we have two, two, two. And now we get to two reads from the brown genome and one from the blue genome. Two from the brown genome, one from the... And here's an interesting case. This is an interesting case where you have this heterozygosity. And in this particular case, you have two brown reads, right? And then you have two blue reads. And it's the blue reads that are showing that this individual is probably heterozygous. But again, if you had a single read that showed a difference between the reference or say just two reads, you wouldn't necessarily know that that individual is heterozygous. So those are some just terms, right? So reference genome, where that came from is during the hum what, from the Human Genome Project, the sequence genome, and then hopefully that these numbers indicate you can see that there's coverage. Here again, for example, there's zero coverage from the brown genome, but um, these nucleotides are covered too. Actually, this is a mistake. This should say you can say that that should say one, one, one there, right? Because there's one nucleotide covering uh, here, but here there's two nucleotides. All right, 
So this gets down to this concept of coverage. So I just want to remind you that fold coverage can also be thought of as average coverage, right? What is the average number here for coverage, either in the diploid condition or say just the haploid condition? You could count up all those numbers and you can get an average. It looks like it might be, I don't know, about three or so, all right? So, but the way that you calculate average coverage is you don't actually just necessarily count it up. You can, but there's a simpler way to do it is just to say, well, how many reads did I sequence? Up here it would be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, all right? So it's the number of reads times the length of each read, and I think those reads were probably on average about 15 base pairs, divided by the target length, all right? And so in this particular case, it would be the number of nucleotides in the reference genome. So that would be the target length, all right? And then that will give you an average, all right? And so once you get that fold coverage or average, you can actually do some interesting things. You can determine what fraction of base pairs from the genome are sequenced 0, 1, 2, or 3 times. Now, obviously, you can figure that out empirically, right? You could just go and map the reads and then count them. But this fold coverage gives you an expectation, all right? And it's the Poisson probability that gives the proportion of the genome covered what we say k times when the fold coverage or the average coverage is this parameter here, this Greek letter lambda. So I'm going to walk through this, all right? So let's just do an example. Suppose fold coverage is 4, which, you know, maybe um, is approximate for this particular case. I think it's a little less than four, but let's suppose it is, all right? So if fold coverage is four, then we can ask using the Poisson, what proportion of the target genome is covered zero, one, two, or three or more times, right? Going back to here, that's places where covered zero times or places that are covered, say for example, uh, one or two times. And let's just go back to the simpler case. Here's the zero cases, and here are the four cases, and here are the three cases, and so on and so forth. So let's go back here. So what proportion is covered four times? So what you do is um, lambda would be equal to four. That's the fold coverage. And then we can ask the, how, what proportion is covered zero times, what proportion is covered one time, two times, three times, four times. You could do more. You could do five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, go on and so forth. And that is determined by filling in this uh, equation here where lambda is going to be plugged in as 4 each time so lambda would be 4 here and it would be 4 here and then k would be 0 in the case of 0 coverage or 1 in the case of 1 coverage so on and so forth and these are the numbers so if it, the average coverage is 4 you know about 2% of the genome will be have a 0 coverage and if average coverage is uh, 4 then about uh, seven percent will have a coverage of one. Four, fifteen percent will have a coverage of two. About twenty percent a coverage of three, and it's actually the same for four. And you can see this with this distribution here, right? So this value here, this is zero, right? That corresponds to zero point one eight, then zero point zero seven three, then zero point one four seven. You can see it's right close to zero point one five and then 0 0.195 is close to 2.20, so on and so forth. And so these would be the probabilities of coverage, you know, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And you can kind of see that, you know, if the average coverage is 4, it's going to be very unlikely that you have reads that are covered 20 times, but that will happen. But if the average coverage is 10, well, then that will be somewhat possible. If the average coverage is... Uh, uh, is is one here right the orange is one then you know more than 35 percent of the genome is going to cut covered zero times or one time all right so just a quick reminder as well so remember that the coverage is the number of reads times the length of each read all right divided by now if you're talking about a haploid genome going back to this case Here's it's this is covered four times because it's covered by one, two, three, four bases, but two of those are from the blue genome and two of those are from the um, brownish orange genome. So, in fact, if we're just thinking about haploid coverage, we're not worrying about the fact that this is a diploid, we would call that four. 
But in fact, at this particular position, two of the reeds are blue and two of the reeds are orange or brown, all right? And that means that at least per actual haploid genome amongst the two, the, 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 uh, the in, within the diploid, you know, the coverage is half of what you'd say is this if you d weren't actually sequencing a diploid as you're just sequencing a haploid genome. So the number of reads for fold coverage times the length of each read divided by the target length for diploid is two times that of the haploid. So to be more clear about that, for haploid condition, the number of reads, this is just for the human genome, but this would be applying to, you know, any kind of genome. Uh, but in, the number is specific to human here. The number of reads times the length of each read divided by 3 billion is the haploid coverage, right? But if you're talking about the diploid coverage, all right, the, the average coverage would be the number of reads times the length of each read divided by 6 billion. And you can see that by doubling the denominator, the fold coverage goes down by 2 because in this particular case we're saying what would be the fold coverage, say, just for the brown genome? Uh, and you would see here it's like 2 and 2 and 2 instead of 4 and 4 and 4, which would be uh, twice as much.